for that little red light. Okay, it looks like we're recording now. Yep, we are um, recording. It's it's going. And I'm watching the clock on my Mac <laughs> to see what it's doing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I have lots of slides, but I am going to end on time. So um, oh, okay, and then we'll great. have time for questions at the end, right? We're going to allow Yes, we will. Questions. Okay, great. Okay. Well, welcome, everyone, to our Nutrition and Cancer series. This is a four-week WebEx uh, with Dr. Deanna Minich, brought to you by Harmony Hill Retreat Center. And my name's Elaine Holland, and I am Harmony Hills Executive Director. Uh, we're a nonprofit retreat center and founded 25 years ago by Gretchen Schotte, and we're located in Union, Washington. For those from not from the Pacific Northwest, Union is two hours west of Seattle on the Olympic Peninsula. Um, Harmony Hills' mission is to transform the lives of those affected by cancer and to inspire healthy living for all. And the, the heart of our mission is our three-day cancer retreat, which we offer once a month for anyone who has been affected by cancer and their caregivers. And the thing that really sets us apart is that that three-day retreat is offered at no cost. Um, Deanna had mentioned in our, in our pre-show, if we can call it that, our, 20, our um, third annual survivorship fair and open house. So please mark your calendars for Saturday, August 25th. And this free event includes lunch. And anyone with cancer, their caregivers, their loved ones, or even if you're just interested in cancer prevention and wellness, you're welcome to attend our survivorship fair on the 25th of August. And if you just joined us, Deanna was saying earlier that she will be giving two talks at the Survivorship Fair in the morning. Everything you were afraid to ask about nutrition, everything you wanted to know about nutrition, we're afraid to ask. And in the afternoon, the top foods to eat and top foods to avoid. Now, we're able to fund this evening's event as well as our cancer retreats and other programs through donations and earned income. The Harmony Hill facilities are available for rent for corporate retreats and meetings, family reunions, weddings, and other celebrations. That's your commercial for Harmony Hill this evening. Um, we believe that good nutrition is pivotal to cancer prevention before, during, and after treatment. And over the next four weeks, we're sponsoring these inspirational and informative sessions on nutrition. If you miss a session or would like to review this evening's presentation, these sessions will be recorded and available on our website, harmonyhill.org. So now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Deanna Minich, who has over 20 years of experience in the fields of nutrition, wellness, and healing. And her unique approach to uh, nutrition combines science and spirituality, practicality and poetry, body and soul, um, aspects within the realm of eating as a means of experiencing greater personal growth through one's relationship with food. Uh, Deanne has earned her PhD from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, and she also has a master's from the University of Chicago in Illinois on nutrition. She's written several books on nutrition, and um, as I've been mentioning, um, as people have been joining, if you are online, you can use the chat feature if you have a question, and Deanna will be addressing those questions at the end of this evening's session. So, Deanna, over to you. Thank you Thank for joining you so us much. tonight. Thank you, Elaine, and I'd like to give a, a huge uh, thank you and, and really open up my heart and gratitude to Harmony Hill Retreat Center. Uh, they've been so phenomenal. Um, I've been teaching there for the cancer retreats over the past years, and it's always such a rewarding uh, experience, at least for me personally, to interact with all of you and to address issues, concerns around nutrition and cancer. So um, I really do thank Harmony Hill for, for putting this out as a service to all of you. I think uh, you're going to <laughs> really walk away from each of these sessions with lots of information. And so there might be times that we, we might go fast and, and um, be really giving you lots of different tips. And again, as Elaine mentioned, you're free to ask questions through the chat function, and I'll address those questions, at least uh, a bulk of them, at the very end. 
So thank you, uh, Harmony Hill, very much for, for doing this. All right, so um, the first webinar in this, in this whole series of four is, um, this one is called Food as Medicine. And I thought it would be worthwhile to really get a foundational talk so that we're setting the stage for the talks to come. And the way that I look at food as medicine, um, we're really going to be addressing how your health connects to all the different aspects of eating. Many times we think about, well, what should I be eating? But really, the how of eating is so important. And what I mean by that is how we're actually eating the food. Um, sometimes a really healthy meal can be very unhealthy because of the manner in which we're eating it. We'll also talk about the where, the why, and the when. So lots of different things to think about uh, during this talk. So let's ask ourselves the question, where are we now? There are lots of different things going on on our planet. And if we look at the Western world, and I know that many of you are calling in from all different places. So the, the Western world is, is definitely changing in its body composition. Many people are overweight and obese. And, um, you know, even skinny people, what we would see as skinny people, can be considered um, overweight by some standards because they may have more fat relative to muscle. So it's really about looking at healthy body composition. But we are seeing a lot of distortions in body composition. We also know that chronic disease is on the rise. Now listening to how many children are being uh, confronted with type 2 diabetes, 15% of teenagers. We're now seeing that the children that have just been born in this past generation have been predicted to not outlive their parents. So life expectancy, while we have the benefit of technology to carry us through into our later years, um, what is anticipated is that we won't be able to sustain that financial burden over the long term. We also know that our food supply is questionable. Many people have concerns about GMOs, genetically modified organisms, of buying organically grown food, buying local, and all of those implications. And I've also written a book um, called An A to Z Guide to Food Additives, Never Eat What You Can't Pronounce. And that was developed with the hope of helping people to become more educated about the foods that they're eating, especially if they're processed foods with labels. And what's really curious is that Michael Pollan, who has written a number of different books, uh, like The Botany of Desire, he's written um, a number of, of, of great consumer-oriented books. And in, in one of them, he, he, he wrote about how the more we know about nutrition, it seems that the less healthy we are. So what is happening, and, and why is that so? Well, we have a lot of things going on in our lives, right? Um, if you look at the, the diet word, right, die with a T on the end, as uh, Dr. Brian Wansink would say, that we're, we're doing the roller coaster dieting, fad diets, uh, looking to the outside for that solution. And in fact, um, for a long time, there was this whole idea of the standard American diet. And when I did some traveling last year, I went to Australia and, and other places, what I learned is that um, there are other parts of the planet that are really um, eating those brown, yellow, and white foods and also experiencing changes in chronic disease and body weight. Portion sizes have uh, become gigantic. Uh, more meals are eaten outside of the home. Uh, there's just a lack of time to prepare foods or to even take the time like you are tonight to become educated on what to look for. Uh, people are skipping meals. In fact, it's very interesting. Many times um, people, especially if they have a, a long work day, they'll forget to eat. Uh, and those are the times that they need the food the most because they need that sustenance. They need the energy from the food. But yet they're forgetting that. We're not making time for it. Rush meals, emotional eating. Uh, in fact, we're going to do a whole webinar series in October. And I really think we should dedicate one of those to emotional eating because 75% of our overeating habits actually come from emotions, whether we're happy, we're sad, or we're upset about something. And then also stress eating, so eating under stress, stressful-like circumstances. Also, if you look at our foods, um, they're coming from nutrient-depleted soils, so they're not very robust in a lot of different minerals like we had about 100 years ago. So even if we're eating good quality food, we may need to supplement uh, in order to fill those deficiencies. Many of us have a lot of stress. 
and I don't think we could have life without stress. It's all about what we do with the stress and how we perceive stress. But it does impact our eating habits for sure. Uh, having a sedentary lifestyle and not getting much activity, I believe that um, successful aging and really keeping young and vital inside requires that we move, requires that we are flowing, whether we're doing exercises mentally or we're doing things physically. And that doesn't always mean going to the gym and working out for 45 minutes. And uh, it could be integrated activity throughout the day. And then also, we're getting lots of mixed nutritional messages. As Elaine mentioned, I'll be giving a talk called Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Nutrition But Were Afraid to Ask. And the real intent of having a talk like that is because so many people are confused. We see things in, in the media that come out. People get confused. You know, well, what does that mean? I thought we weren't supposed to do that. And so, you know, it's, it's hard to look at the truth underneath all of that. And then the latest thing, and this really does apply to cancer as well, is the increased amount of toxins in our environment and our increased toxin burden. It's really something that has become an issue. And um, case in point, uh, even before a baby has been born, that baby has had a, um, an elevated toxin burden relative to babies um, from decades ago. And of course, those toxins make their way into the, the fetus through the umbilical cord blood. So, and, and babies are going to be even more susceptible. So um, we're all really susceptible to toxins. It's just a matter of how susceptible we are and how we can minimize them. So you can imagine, I'm kind of setting the stage here for all the things that we're confronted with. And we may feel like we are fatigued. I know that many of you probably feel that sensation of just low energy. So how can you even get out to exercise? That doesn't seem uh, plausible, right? You feel lifeless or maybe even on the verge of breakdown. Or maybe even to add to this list, just confused, just really not knowing where to turn. So I mentioned this whole idea of um, our, our changing body composition. And one of the things that's really happening is um, the, the whole idea of increased belly fat. So just as the, the picture denotes here, this is an indicator straight off the bat. Uh, this is an indicator of potentially issues managing glucose, which is sugar in the body, and insulin. So, um, you know, with the types of foods that are being taken in now, what, what tends to happen is the body stops being sensitive. And so then we get into this state where we might be overfed and undernourished. The cells aren't getting the nutrition. So this really adds to the stress because, you know, all of those other things, feeling lifeless, feeling fatigued, if we had proper nutrition, we might not feel the effects of that so much. But because our bodies aren't getting the nutrition it needs, we may feel even more uh, predisposed to um, symptoms and even chronic disease. All right, so this is where we come into today's topic, which is food as medicine. And the reason why I mention that phrase, food as medicine, is because it comes from one of the, um, the, the oldest physicians, Hippocrates. And I believe he said this back in 500 BC. And already there was this wisdom of let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. So the question is, how do we get back to that? How do we get back to the whole idea of utilizing food in a way that is medicinal and benefits our bodies? If we think of um, the agricultural age, and um, uh, when I was growing up, my grandfather uh, grew up on a farm, a dairy farm in Wisconsin. And you think of, when you think of food, you, you might think of the pastoral images of a field or farms. And of course, a lot of that is, is changing. You know, ideally, we, we'd like to see um, people growing their own food and supporting farms, and especially local farmers, and supporting organically grown produce. And what we are seeing now is um, this, as you see here, this picture of the grocery stores typically are interface with food now. We, we have moved away from that pastoral image, many of us, and now we're immersed in under the fluorescent lights um, into the sea of numbers and labels and boxes and cardboard and metal and all different types of packaging. So it can be quite daunting and, uh, and feel very overwhelming. This is a grocery store that I happened to go into uh, late on a Saturday night. And you can see here, 
it may not feel very inviting. So again, how do we get back to forming that deep relationship, a meaningful relationship with food? So what if one day, instead of going to the pharmacy with a P-H-A-R-M-A-C-Y, we go to the pharmacy? Um, and this is just kind of a play on words, of course. It's a cartoon with the, the farmer behind the counter is the pharmacist with the F saying, take one a day with tomato and cucumber. And he's handing her a, uh, a head of lettuce there. So this, again, speaking to the whole concept of food as medicine. So if we look at the science, at the science, this is not just anecdotal and it's not just going back uh, hundreds of years and, and looking at those patterns. It's really even that the current science is supporting the fact that healthy living can add 14 years. And this is just one particular study. There are many of these types of studies. So these are looking at populations that live long. What are they doing? What is making them be vital and, and have that smile on her face here, right? This is so, this is how you want to be as you get into your 70s, 80s, 90s, 100s, right? So what they're finding is that these individuals tend not to smoke. They tend to eat at least five servings of fruits and vegetables. And indeed, they consume modest amounts of medicinal beverages, whether it's red wine, green tea, um, a, a number of different things. And it doesn't mean that if you don't consume wine that you should be consuming wine and that that is healthful. For some people, it may not be. Um, and then also getting some activity, some leisure. Now, note the, the wording here, leisure time activity meaning that you want some time where it doesn't feel stressful. You know, I'm imagining people at the gym on the treadmill. They've got their, um, their iPod in. You know, it's just more stress, more media, looking at the television, right? But not really being in nature. In fact, there's a wonderful book that just came out, and I think it's called the Your Brain in Nature by Eva Selhub. She talks about how exercise in nature is like exercise squared, or you almost amplify the effects of activity. Because not only are you getting the benefits of the physical exercise, you're smelling the smells of nature, the trees, the, the rain potentially. Um, you're getting visual cues that you may not otherwise have in a crowded gym that is sweaty and you know, you're bombarded again and you don't really get some downtime, more of a yin experience rather than a yang experience. So the power of food as medicine really comes from the fact of knowing that foods and eating provide messages to our genes. And this is really um, well accepted. This is not me postulating this. The whole aspect of nutrigenomics or the impact of nutrients on genes is a real thing. And in fact, I would say probably uh, for the past 10 to 15 years, this has been even more pronounced that we're seeing that things that we're eating come into our body, interact with our DNA, and eventually our body is made of the proteins that were signaled by those foods. Now, note in the title here, I'm not just writing food. It's also about how we're eating. And I would even go beyond that to say that it's about how we're thinking, what we're doing. Um, all of the things that we do in our life is essentially sending messages to our genes. Now, let's zoom into the cell. And when we zoom into that cell and kind of view everything here, and this is just a cartoon of a cell, up at the top we see kind of the entry of what can come into the cell. And then inside the cell, you can see that there are a number of different colored circles. These are little proteins that are relaying messages to one another. So imagine you eat something. You have a blueberry. We were just talking about blueberries before we got on a call. You eat a blueberry. The blueberry constituents get all broken up through your digestive tract and eventually get in through your bloodstream and make their way into cells in some particular organ of your body. Let's just say it's your brain because we were talking about the brain. What happens is that little blueberry component signals on the outside of the cell, is received by that cell, and then there's like this relay race inside the cell. All of these messages start to trickle on in. And it's almost like in kindergarten when you would play that telephone game where you tell somebody in line a word and then that word just keeps getting transmitted by everybody in the row. Same thing with these messages from food. So they come into the cell and all of a sudden you get this whole coordinated 
symphonic uh, transmission all the way to the DNA, which is right there at the bottom, that twisted long spiral structure. That's your DNA, and then based on whatever messages it's receiving, it's going to turn out certain proteins, and then those proteins go back out of the cell and make up our bodies. So I'm going to toss out a fancy word here. That fancy word is called epigenetics, and you may have already heard this term. You may not have. Uh, all it means, if we break down the word, epi means over or on top of your genetics, meaning that just because you have a certain genome, meaning, uh, you know, many people think, oh, I've got good genes or I've got bad genes. Well, in this time issue, which came out in January 2010, the, the headline, as you can see on the, on the cover page, is why your DNA isn't your destiny. The new science of epigenetics reveals how the choices you make can change your genes and those of your kids. So indeed, what is happening is that food is not only impacting our DNA and what is it being expressed, it's really impacting how that DNA is interacting within the cell. And we can change up how that DNA is turning things on and turning things off through this whole science of epigenetics. Let me give you a quick example, because that may not, there may be a lot of science there for you to digest. If I eat broccoli, and I'm chewing the broccoli, and the broccoli components come in, it goes to the level of the cell. Now, broccoli happens to have constituents, these compounds, that change up how tightly the DNA is wound together. And you can imagine that if it's wound really tight, it may prevent some things from being turned on. If it's really loose, it may allow things to be expressed and, and turned on. So broccoli, there are things in broccoli that help the DNA to express genes that are favorable when it comes to things like cancer prevention. So this is uh, epigenetics, a fancy term to mean that you are more than your DNA. And food is more than medicine. You know, when I think of the word medicine, it sounds very clinical and sterile. And really, food and eating, if you think about it, it's, it's much more than that. Of course, it's information. We have that information that comes in with every meal, signaling to ourselves. But I don't want us to forget the aspects of the soul, of connection, of interconnection with people and places and events and, and memories, because all of that is important for our physiology, too. In fact, many times I'm seeing that people get into this mode of analysis paralysis. They get so much information, and then they lose their sense of pleasure with eating, and that's not healthy either. You really need to make sure that you, you stay within that realm of de-stressing. So I like this uh, quote from, from Michael Pollan in his book, uh, In Defense of Food. He says, food is also about pleasure, about community, about family and spirituality. It's about our relationship to the natural world and about expressing our identity. As long as humans have been taking meals together, eating has been as much about culture as it has been about biology. So I know that you know that, and I want to bring this up because it needs to be a piece part in our whole discussion of food as medicine because relationship is medicine too. So eating is more than taking a bite of food. I think that when we think of the word eating, we might get this image of a person taking a bite of food with their fork or their spoon or with their hands or there's a meal in front of them. But really, there are so many things that are involved, everything from cultivating your own food, harvesting, distributing, um, acquiring the food, preparing the food. When you start preparing the food, you're already eating. When you're in the grocery store selecting food or you're in the garden picking food, you're already eating. There are already signals being sent to your body, to your mind that is dot, dot, dot. It's kind of signaling out there into the ethers of, you know, what kind of meal am I going to have? And this does create uh, kind of a precedent for that, that eating experience, right? It kind of creates the, paves the way. Um, even presentation of the food and also fertilization. You know, I know many nutritionists uh, are very comfortable talking about fertilization, uh, talking about bowel movements, but it is an extension of the eating process. And so much of our process of eating can really be represented by also our bowel movements. I think it's really important. So let's talk about what you eat. 
Very important. Uh, when you survey the typical American, now keep in mind this is the latest statistic I have. This is from the USDA in 2000, 12 years ago. You can imagine it's probably about the same or maybe a slightly increased, that the average American eats 2,000 pounds of food per year. Wow. That's a lot of information running through the tube, going in and out. And of course, we're not taking all of that in. We are um, obviously being selective about what we're taking in and letting some of that out, of course. But just think of that, two, roughly 2,000 pounds of food for the average adult every year. And if you, I'm a very visual person, so I want to give you a visual of what that might look like. If you think of a person's lifetime living into their seventh or their eighth decade, what that amounts to is roughly about 150,000 pounds of food. Well, I don't really have a good sense of what that might be. So I, I basically equated that into and, and calculated that that is about 15 elephants worth of food in a lifetime. So I thought it might be interesting for me to do a quick run through of people all over the planet. What are they eating? What is the information that they're bringing into their bodies? And um, what, what is being signaled to their cells? So this comes from a book called The Hungry Planet. As you can see at the bottom there, there's the reference. Peter Menzel, who um, is a journalist and photographer couple who went throughout the planet and took pictures of people and what they were eating over one week. So in all of these pictures that you're going to see, and I'll go through them fairly quickly, you'll see the, the number of people in the photograph are being fed by the, the food that's presented in front of them over one week's time. So in this picture, this family from Germany, four people being fed over seven days by all the foods that, that are laid before them. And they're spending, as you can see at the top, about $500 per week to feed the family. So just, you know, quickly observe here and, and see what you see, what looks curious, right? Lots of bottles, lots of those UHT containers of liquid. Here's a, the American family that they, um, that they studied. And of course, we know that all throughout the United States is very different, depending on the south or the north or east or west. But this is just one family uh, from North Carolina. As you can see, their expenditure here, four people being fed by, by these foods. And as you might detect here, uh, indeed, you might see a, a McDonald's or a Burger King, um, a little bit more in the way of processed foods there and lots of different name brands really shouting out. Here's a family from Italy, and the reason why I put a family from Italy in here is because of the Mediterranean diet, which we hear so much about. And as you can see, here we have five people in this family being fed by uh, lots of bread, lots of vegetables, and uh, you can see bottled goods in the back and, and, and some ready-to-eat cereals and boxed items up behind them. Here's a family from Mexico, and, and Mexico is very interesting because they are definitely uh, becoming much more American uh, in, in the eating, as you can see by the, the bottles of Coca-Cola, the, the different processed foods there, combining those with their whole foods. Here's a family from Eastern Europe, so from Poland, and you can see that uh, lots of root vegetables, Lots of yogurt on the left there, which is very important, especially for creating a healthy gut. Egypt. Now look at the difference here. We now have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 people being fed by all of this food on this table. And as you can tell, much of it is fresh food, which is, which is wonderful. This is uh, my, fav my favorite family from Ecuador. And note, again, a number of people being fed by a um, uh, smaller amount of food and a lot of vegetables, grains, and um, not a lot of processed foods, at least not in the traditional sense of store-bought foods. Here's a family from Bhutan. Again, many more people, less food, and more dry foods, as you might see here, spices, chili peppers, and such. And here we have the, the last one, a family from Chad. Uh, and you can see the, um, the containers of liquid of water in the back and uh, legumes, spices, more dried goods. So um, lots of different people eating lots of different things that's signaling different things to their cells. And many people say to me, well, 
you know, I just had one meal. It was just one fast food meal. Um, you know, is it really that impactful? And what I would tell you is um, not to say that, you know, you can never have uh, foods like that, um, although you, you definitely do want to minimize them because or eliminate altogether, and that's because these one single meals that we have tend to, uh, they, they can cascade and they, they can really build up in their effects. Just after one meal, you can change your physiology for up to six hours. So um, seeing increased bacterial toxins in the blood, more oxidative stress, um, more blood pressure changes, and greater response to stress. I'm just getting a message here. Um, they can't. So can everybody see the slides? Just a, a quick technical question here. I want to be sure that you are seeing the slides. That is the intent, not to just see me talking. But I have a number of slides that I'm running through here. OK, sounds like yes. All right, good. So one meal can change how you respond to stress even. Now, this is a very interesting study. Basically, they took people subjected them to different stressors like doing a math assignment, public speaking, um, basically occluding or blocking the, the arm and, and creating stress there in terms of blood pressure or even putting a hand into cold water, cold press. And what they found is that when the individuals were on a high fat, one meal, high fat versus low fat, that when they had this high fat meal that they responded worse uh, in terms of their blood pressure when it came to these individual stressors. Now, how do we blunt that? Well, one of the things that we can do is by adding vegetables to these meals. Very important because these vegetables have the power to change our physiological response to a meal. So thinking of plant foods, which I feel very passionate about, especially from a cancer perspective, I think it's also worthwhile as we start talking about plant foods now to talk about, you know, why would we choose organic? Why is that so important? And of course, organic foods carry different messages. If you think about it, plants are very intelligent. They're in one place, so they're not able to really move around, obviously, you know, other than growing uh, limbs or, or branches or leaves in order to extend out. But they have to essentially fend for themselves in their environment. So if you take away things like pesticides, herbicides, and insecticides, what can happen is we make them stronger. They actually start to produce different compounds. And we dilute less of those good compounds with the um, fertilizer and such that we might try to incorporate if it's organically grown. So an organically grown um, vegetable will have this, this good stress applied to it. And keep in mind, if we're, if we're eating food, we're eating all of the messages of that food. Even though we may want stress in vegetables, we don't want stress in animal foods, right? Um, if you think of uh, chickens being raised in a field like this one, this rooster, with you know being able to graze and to eat grass and insects and all the natural things it does, rather than be cooped up and be angry and um, you know really be unwell, and then we eat that message. Of course, that's not very helpful. So plant foods are incredibly important for human health for just about all the different chronic diseases. And I asked the question, um, you know, in doing a lot of research on plant foods, I was wondering whether or not chronic disease might be on the rise because we're not eating enough fruits and vegetables. Of course, all the things that we started out talking about um, with, you know, how we're eating and stress eating and not getting activity, all of this plays a role. But I also think it's really relevant, and we can add to that list, the fact of not eating enough fruits and vegetables and how that really does impact our health. In fact, if you look at the top foods, the fruits and vegetables that are eaten in the United States, <laughs> many of them, if we look at iceberg lettuce, not exactly the best quality green that we could choose, tomatoes, which includes tomato sauce, pasta sauces, uh, potatoes, of course, mainly French fries, bananas, um, and oranges mainly is juice. So not really um, a good top five pick for fruits and vegetables. Typically, you want the darker green lettuce. 
You don't want to have fried um, vegetables, or at least minimize those as much as possible. And instead of juice, it would be really great just to have the whole food, because otherwise we, we tend to get a lot of sugar all in one sitting. What the average American gets is about one and a half servings of vegetables and about one serving of fruit per day. And that hasn't changed very much over the course of time. So that's not really meeting the five to nine. And in fact, it's now five to 13 servings that um, are being advocated. So on average, 80% um, of Americans, when they are surveyed, were found not to be getting enough colored foods. You know, again, I mentioned the brown, yellow, white foods that many people are eating. Let's just take breakfast, right? Breakfast tends to be what? Bacon, ready-to-eat cereal, um, tends to be um, bagels, eggs, a lot of food that is devoid of color. And in fact, that's one meal where if you can get some color, it'd be really important, especially because the whole night, you know, you, you've really had this nice empty stomach and you've processed a lot. Now you want to get your day off to a good start. So the, the color of food is, is really important. And I, I talk about this all the time. If you go to fiveaday.gov, um, what I did is I laid out here why these certain colors. Well, because you're getting lots of different phytonutrients. Lycopene in the red foods, anthocyanins, astaxanthin in shrimp. And a lot of these uh, things are, are found in a variety of different foods, everything from vegetables to fruits beets, red raspberries, strawberries, tomato-based um, products as well. So pick your choice. Uh, and especially in the summer months, it's so much easier to come by a lot of these different red foods, of course. Orange foods. What about orange foods? Well, the two big um, orange phytonutrients that I tend to think of are beta-carotene, which you probably know is a precursor to vitamin A. Vitamin A is wonderful for the immune system, potent antioxidant. Um, definitely helps to um, maintain good vision. Many people think of vitamin A for the eyes, and that's, that's true. It's one of its functions. And we tend to find beta carotene in things like carrots and sweet potatoes, pumpkin, butternut squash, cantaloupe, mangoes, apricot, peaches, all of these wonderful orange foods. Bioflavonoids, what are those? They are antioxidants that work in concert with vitamin C. So vitamin C together with the bioflavonoids helps to strengthen your capillaries. So if you're concerned about capillary fragility, varicose veins, or having a good vascular system, and heart disease still remains the number one killer in the Western world, uh, it would be good to get these bioflavonoids, which are found in a variety of orange foods. Here's a whole list of different options here. Many wonderful tropical fruits as well as root vegetables. Yellow-green, I'm going to put those two together because oftentimes they coexist. Um, the yellow compound that you find uh, in these yellow-green vegetables, like lutein, lutein makes its way into the macula, the back of the eye, and helps to reduce the risk of cataracts or macular degeneration. So things like kale, kale is so rich in lutein, it's, it's one of those power foods. Um, a lot of different leafy green vegetables here. What about the indoles or the glucosinolates? I mentioned broccoli before. The stinky sulfur cruciferous vegetables are so incredibly therapeutic and healing for you. So there are a number of different options here. And if you don't like Brussels sprouts, well, you can try something else, uh, whether it's kale or watercress. There's a whole number of different things to select there. Chlorophyll, the green color, is a very potent antioxidant. And in fact, chlorophyll can bind the heterocyclic amines that you find in cooked foods and help to carry those out of the body. In fact, uh, chlorophyll, the more chlorophyll we have in our diet, the more we'll reduce our body odor as well, offensive body odor, which is always an interesting tidbit. And folates. Uh, and folates, I mentioned the leafy greens when we were talking earlier, very important for, for cell growth and different processes. So there are lots of different options here for green foods, uh, a number of green uh, variety um, options here. OK, blue-purple. I mentioned before that blue is for the brain. And indeed, um, as you can see here, those anthocyanin components that you find in blueberries, blackberries, purple grapes, black currants, elderberries, the whole host, 
can really help with brain function and help to reduce memory loss because of their, their function as very potent antioxidants. The phenolics are also important. You find those in things like plums, raisins, eggplant. They help to reduce the effects of aging. So here are a number of different options here. Instead of just the green kale, going with the purple kale or the purplish. Purple cabbage, purple potatoes even, which tend to be lower in glycemic impact. Um, eggplant, a number of different uh, fruit options as well. Now, um, one other point that I mentioned when I mentioned chlorophyll and binding these heterocyclic amines, another product that can occur in our food when we cook it is this fancy term called advanced glycation end products. When we have a protein combined with a carbohydrate in the presence of heat, this can create this what we call age. This is the acronym. And these components can be very inflammatory to the body and accelerate aging. So as you can see, it's very intuitive as to where you would find those types of uh, foods. Anything that's fried or overcooked, Things like bacon are very high in these ages. Uh, pizza crust, fried meats of, of various types, uh, fried potatoes, and even um, toast. Anything, again, that's been overcooked or browned in some way will carry uh, varying levels of these advanced glycation end products. What about sweeteners? So Elaine was asking about sweeteners for her mother and, you know, what to do because so many of us do have a sugar addiction. So what do you do with sweeteners? And this is something we can probably have a whole lecture on is just talking about sweeteners because as you can see here, as I have in my book, uh, A to Z Guide to Food Additives, there, sugar goes by many different names. Um, everything from agave nectar, you know, essentially the body sees sugar as sugar. There are some slight differences, but for the most part, it's either it's going to raise your blood sugar or not. Um, and it may in influence your body's production of different fats. Glycemic index is an important concept, and um, what it refers to is the ability of a food to release sugar into your bloodstream. So a food that has a high glycemic index is just, you know, take white bread or take table sugar. Very high. What you see is a peak forming in the blood initially, and then you kind of roller coaster down, and that's not very healthy for the body. What you want are these smooth rolling hills, this kind of low glycemic impact that uh, kind of, it, it doesn't keep you craving the sugar. So there are lots of different uh, foods that are high glycemic index, medium, low glycemic index, as you can see here. And typically, high glycemic index foods are the refined foods, a lot of juices, sport drinks, energy drinks. Medium glycemic uh, index foods would be things like root vegetables, whole grains, um, and then low glycemic index foods. One phenomenal meal that is very low glycemic is to make dal, D-A-L, or where you take lentils and, and cook them. Uh, typically, you find that in an in Indian restaurant, very low glycemic index, and then they put spices in that on top of it, which will further um, add to the healing properties. One other thing I wanted to draw to your attention is the therapeutic um, potential or ability of uh, bitter plants. So these green leafy bitter plants like arugula, like mustard greens, like collard greens, um, kind of the spicy bitter plants, they're very medicinal in that um, essentially what you see is that people that consume these bitter plants tend to have uh, to fare a little bit better in body composition. So there have been some really interesting studies about people that can taste bitter versus people that cannot taste bitter. So it would be good to get some bitter foods into your, your diet, these bitter greens, because what they do is they stimulate the stomach to produce healthy levels of stomach acid. Now you may think, well, I thought I don't want stomach acid. But we actually do want good, healthy stomach acid because as we get older, we start producing too little stomach acid. And then that creates all of the bacterial overgrowth in the stomach. Toxicity is also an issue. Um, as I mentioned before, when we first started, so many different toxins out there, everything from 
farming practices, mercury and fish, lead and water, um, you know, just even small amounts of lead that we take in can increase blood pressure, can really, we're starting to see an association now between these heavy metals and cardiovascular disease. So you definitely want to be on the lookout for those. Uh, we already mentioned the advanced glycation end products. Uh, think of the heterocyclic amines and charbroiled meats, and even the naturally occurring plant, tox plant toxins like aflatoxin. So think of things like peanut butter that contain these, these, uh, these molds or these, these different toxins. So that was a whirlwind um, on the, the what of eating, but I hope that you, you got a good sense of, you know, looking at food as medicine, what are the foods that are really preferred in terms of changing our physiology? Foods of color, foods that are not overly cooked, uh, et cetera, bitter, bitter plants. So what about how you eat? This is something I feel really passionate about. Sometimes I can be seeing clients who um, are very healthy eaters, but they're not um, healthy in, in the way of how they're eating. So they're, they're making all the right choices, but the way that they're eating is not very beneficial. So they, be, they might be very unaware. They might be overeating because they're unaware. Maybe they're skipping eating altogether. Maybe they're eating because they feel emotional or maybe bored. Uh, or maybe they're eating because they're stressed. And sometimes what stress, um, what you see is that people either stop eating or they start overeating and also rushed eating. So I'd like you to remember this. If there's just one thing that you remember from tonight in this food is medicine talk, I want you to remember this quote, that how we eat is how we live. And now there's another sentence to that. How we live is how we eat. So the takeaway here is that if we change how we eat, if we start slowing down our eating, chances are we might start rippling that effect out into how we're living. Conversely, if we change how we're living, we start to improve the quality of things that we're doing and selecting and injecting some activity into our lives. What we may find is that our eating choices, how we eat, what we're eating, starts to change as well. So this is a really important statement. I, I have found this repeatedly with people. So the how of eating. <laughs> Obviously, we, we don't want to be engaged in the steering meal here, um, eating and doing the dashboard dining. It's not safe. It's not good for the digestive tract. Here's a little excerpt from a newspaper talking about the police stopping a driver eating a bowl of cereal. So I'm sure that you might have had one or two experiences eating in the car. Um, but keep in mind that it's not probably very good for our digestion, especially if you're feeling very frustrated on the road. It's not safe to you or other people around you. So we know that people are usually doing something else when they're eating. In fact, in this survey they found that people are typically watching television when they're eating. Um, they're also often too busy, especially mothers, they're too busy to sit down and eat. They tend to eat while standing up and doing other things, putting the laundry uh, into the, the dryer or um, talking on the phone or if you're working, pe people tend to be in front of their computers while they're munching. So what tends to happen if we're not aware and we're not giving attention to that meal is that we may run the risk of actually eating more than we need. Now I think that this is really interesting that um, they measured the eating rate as assessed by number of bites of food per minute in children and then correlated that with their body weight. And what they found is that kids that were overweight tended to take more bites per minute than kids that were lower normal weight or higher normal weight. So this might denote that these children were not very mindful. And in fact, in the same study, they looked at how the parents were eating. The parents were also not eating very mindful either. Now, there's a wonderful um, book, as I mentioned before, it's called Mindless Eating, and they do, um, they ha have a number of different consumer type studies. And one of them was when people ate in a restaurant and then they would come out of the restaurant and then they would ask them how much they ate, what they found was that on average, people that are normal weight think they've eaten 20% less than they actually did. Whereas people that are obese tend to underestimate how much they eat by a much greater percentage, 30 to 50 percent. So there might be kind of what we would call portion distortion, 
where we're not really aware of how much we're actually eating. So it's not to say that you have to get into the, again, analysis paralysis mode, but when we're mindful and when we're aware, we're tending to know exactly how much we're eating and how that really fits with our body's needs. So what about where you eat? Is that important? Well, indeed it is. Um, if you're eating with others, or if you're eating on the run, that's going to change some, some dynamics up a little bit. So this study found that eating dinner with others was significantly associated with better dietary intake, more green um, and uh, orange vegetable intake as well as other fruits and vegetables. Now, I would just put a disclaimer here is that it probably depends who you're eating with. Not everybody will be fueling those good healthy eating habits in you. So take note of that. Eating on the run, on the other hand, was significantly associated with higher intakes of soft drinks, fast food, total fat and saturated fat, and lower intake of several healthful foods. So eating on the run may not be uh, as healthy as you, as you might assume. So when it comes to fast food eating, what we see here is that, um, as this study denoted, compared with adults who reported eating at a fast food restaurant, two or more times per week, adults reported not eating at fast food restaurants were more successful at weight loss maintenance. So what does that mean? That means that the more you're eating out, the more you're not making time for food preparation, probably the less quality food choices you're making, which might lead to challenges with keeping weight off if you've lost some weight. So what about the whole idea of supersizing? And of course, this has been an issue. There's a whole movie that we showed at Harmony Hill last summer called Supersize Me. And um, essentially, just again, keeping in touch with our portions. So if we are eating in front of the television, um, what we may tend to do, as I mentioned before, many people are, as it states here, for each one hour increment of television viewing per day, there were higher intakes of sugar-sweetened beverages, fast food, red and processed meat, total energy intake, and percent energy intake from trans fat. So just imagine, for if you watched two hours of TV, you'd have even higher amounts of those, those different foods and beverages. And you would have lower intakes of fruits and vegetables, calcium, and dietary fiber. And especially among young children, in this case, they looked at three-year-olds, more television viewing was associated with adverse dietary practices. And the way I see it is, is if we're programming our children early with poor dietary practices and patterns, this really sets the stage for them, and it's much harder to undo that as an adult. So our environment definitely influences our eating. The where of eating is very important to denote. Uh, and in fact, um, if I'm working with people, I like to go to their homes to do counseling because I want to see their plates. I want to see the size of their fork, the size of their glasses. Much of the calories that we ta take in is really um, programmed through our serving wear. And in fact, Dr. Wansing found that 72% of our calories come from food that we eat from bowls, plates, and glasses. And of course, there are visual illusions that distort our intake, right? Now, I'm from the Midwest, and I remember growing up thinking, I need to eat everything on my plate. Clean your plate. And I'm sure many of you received that same message. And as a result of hearing that or having that, that sense of, you know, not wanting to waste, what tends to happen is we, we keep the plate as the target rather than our own body as the, the gauge of hunger or fullness. So imagine the plate gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, you can imagine that your, your intake is going to increase, re irrespective of whether or not your body really needs to have that much. So here's a little uh, visual illusion here. If I were to ask you which black circle is larger, you might say, that the one on the left looks a bit larger. If you were just looking at this quickly, it, it kind of looks a, a little bit bigger, right? But you know that this is an illusion, and so they're essentially the same size. So keep this in mind, because if we have a portion of food on a big plate, 
versus a portion of food, that same portion, on a smaller plate, it may give our brain the illusion that we're getting more food and hence not needing to eat so much. Same thing here. Which line is longer, the horizontal or the vertical? Well, they are actually the same size, believe it or not. And this is very odd because I've... <laughs> I just can't imagine, but it is. They're both the same. And what Dr. Wansink found as well is that people will tend to drink more, 25 to 30% more from a short, wide glass than from a tall, skinny glass because we think we're getting more from that tall, skinny glass. The short, wide glass doesn't feel like it's so much, so we can have some more. What about eating at parties? Well, what he found in these, these studies is that if you take two rooms of where a party is and you have the same amount of food in both rooms, in one room you have three bowls and in the other room you have 12 bowls and you just spread out the food in the 12 bowls versus the three bowls, people in the room with the 12 bowls will increase the amount that they're eating by 18%. So it's almost like a psychological cue of if we think we have greater variety and we want to try more, it's just the human idea of, you know, wanting to experience, right? So we're going to go around to those 12 bowls or maybe more of those bowls than we would if there were just three bowls in the room at a party. So apply that now to a buffet, right? Because with a buffet, uh, we have all those different selections. The chance is greater that you will take from more of those different selections. If you want to slow down your eating, one thing you can do is eat with an eating utensil that you're not normally accustomed to eating with. So one is chopsticks. Um, in fact, this work as well from Mindless Eating showed that more normal weight than obese people use chopsticks. It just takes longer. It keeps you more in the moment. So what you can do is really overcome your environment. You know, mini sizing your boxes and your bowls uh, buying smaller plates, maybe eating from an appetizer plate instead of a full dinner size plate, using small pieces of silverware, and watch out for those leftovers, right? Because usually that food is not very vital, so you're going to have in your refrigerator all these little side dishes, and you probably might feel the urge to just pick and, and pick from all the different selections there. Okay, why you eat. So the, the diet word, we, we already mentioned this and the, the whole aspect of why that word is so charged, right? And, and going on a diet, you know, why do we go on diets, right? We're trying to get into balance with our body and food. But what we find is that when people are restrained in their eating, this is fascinating, this study. What they showed is that it's actually very stressful. And the stress leads to increased aging, especially in women that are postmenopausal compared with women that have not gone through the, the uh, menopause. Okay? Postmenopausal women tend to be more inflamed and have a number of other issues going on. So their stress reserves are not as robust as somebody that has not gone through the menopause. So dieting is tricky. Uh, stress eating as well can, um, as I mentioned, creating the sense of feeling restrained. You know, are we eating? Why are we eating? Are we eating because we're stressed? Um, well, if so, then we, we might tend to break out of that and, and want to eat foods that we weren't, aren't normally accustomed to eating or foods that we know aren't really good for us. So dieting or restrained eating increases the likelihood of food craving. It kind of brings out our teenage mentality, right? And we know that stress fuels eating. And if we wanted to, um, if our bodies were stressed and we crave broccoli, that'd be great. But typically what happens is we start craving things like ice cream and chips and things that are high in sugar and fat. So emotions can definitely drive us to eat, as you can tell by this picture here. <laughs> the pasta, right? So emotional hunger, you know, how do we know if we're emotionally eating? Well, why? Um, well, it'll be sudden. It's for a specific food. Sometimes you just have to veer off to the side of the road to get those M&Ms or something sweet. Um, it tends to be really urgent and promotes guilt. It, it kind of perpetuates the whole cycle. And emotional eating does lead to these poor food choices, just like I mentioned before with stress high energy dense foods, cakes and ice cream and such. 
So the, the takeaway here is that with more restraint, when you're told you can have something, you tend to have more episodes of emotional eating. So again, if we're on a diet and we're thinking we can't have something, we might tend to have more uh, bouts or more inclination to be an emotional eater. And also greater amounts of other things, greater anxiety, depression, and lower self-esteem. All right, so relaxation as best you can, whatever it takes, whatever your system of relaxation is, can help to reduce emotional eating. It also helps to change gene expression. So pick a mode of relaxation you like. It could be everything from deep breathing to taking a walk, going hiking, hanging out with your pets at home, whatever it is, it's really important. In fact, relaxation has been shown to be more important than thorough chewing when it comes to carbohydrate digestion. So if you're stressed, chances are you're not going to have all those good stomach juices to help you digest your food. All right, the last one, when you eat. Really important to think about that, right? So I mentioned that we're consumed by eating. We make more than 200 decisions about food per day, which is quite shocking. So we're in constant relationship with food. And we're at about 6 million interactions with food and eating in a lifetime, which is just immense. So eating frequently can be important um, for, for some of us. It can help keep our blood sugar stable. There have been studies on nibblers versus gorgers, people that nibble throughout the day versus gorging on these three big meals. So by nibbling on low glycemic foods throughout the day, we tend to have less of a, an inclination to reach for, for high sugar foods to give us energy. It's also important, and I know it sounds counterintuitive, but you need to eat to lose weight. Uh, indeed, um, snacking on healthful foods throughout the day, these low glycemic index foods, when you compare snackers versus non-snackers, if you're not eating, your body gets the message to store fat. It goes into starvation mode. So giving it these small amounts of food throughout the day can actually um, not only help your energy, help your body weight and help your metabolism and not be so much for your digestive tract to take in. So choosing a good breakfast is, is essential, making sure, again, you get lots of color. And that if you are a night owl, making sure that uh, you don't suffer from nighttime eating syndrome, NES, where we consume about 15% of our calories at night. So if you're one of these folks that find that you start craving foods at night, shake up your routine. Maybe you need to do some of your activity at night in order to either burn off some of those calories or to detract from eating. So here's the study showing that uh, nighttime eaters consumed about 15% of their daily energy during these episodes. And as you can see here, these two lines, the nighttime eater versus the non-nighttime eater, you can see that during the later part of the day, their eating starts to change. There's consuming many more calories. All right, so the last bite here. So I think it's really important uh, at the close here to bring back the soul to eating uh, in whatever way that we feel comfortable, really recognizing the interconnection. I love this quote from Adele Davis. She says, we are indeed much more than what we eat, but what we eat can nevertheless help us to be much more than what we are. And it's really true. So um, what I'm going to do is I have a handout for you, and Harmony Hill will provide that. Um, but it's the, looking at the what of eating, the how of eating, the where of eating, the why of eating, the when of eating, all the things that we talked about. And it'll take you through some tips through the what you're eating, the how you eat, where you eat, why you eat, and when you eat. And you'll have that all on one sheet. And everything that I have here is what you'll have on that paper. So. I want to thank you for, for being with me this evening. Um, if you do want some more information on the, the whole umbrella program of Nutrition for the Soul, you can find my website, foodandspirit.com. And I also have a Facebook page, Food and Spirit, with Deanna Minnick, and that will give you lots of different daily tips. So I want to thank you very much for your attention this evening. I know that it's probably good weather where you're at, so good on you for, for making time for this, and I welcome any questions that you have. Uh, Deanna, thank you so much for your time tonight. And um, what's the topic for next Sunday at 6? I don't 
think she so Elaine, uh, are you able I'm I let's see. I might have to Okay, Deanna, can you hear me? Okay, I'm not hearing you. Okay. Uh I'll send you Okay. Sorry, I'm still not I'm not hearing Elaine here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the chat function just to see if there are any questions. Love to take your questions. Um, if you have any, please feel free to just send me uh, a quick question. So I'm seeing here, um, ah, a very wise person here that asked this question. All right, so she is asking, Celestial Seasonings makes a delicious hibiscus iced tea pre-sweetened with stevia. Is there evidence that the sweetness in stevia acts similarly to artificial sweeteners that mimic glucose signals to the cells concerning regulating insulin that will make a greater craving for more calories later? Catherine, what you're saying is actually something that I've thought about um, and my hesitation in uh, overdoing stevia use. The good part of stevia is that it's a, um, a low glycemic sweetener. It essentially doesn't impact blood sugar. But it is a high intensity sweetener like you are saying here. And what we know is that there are taste receptors for sweet in our small intestine. And those taste receptors for sweet signal satiety, metabolism. Uh, they can change the, the gut function. So even though there's no science, there's no evidence per se like you're asking, what I would say is that I, I definitely recommend switching up sweeteners, not getting too uh, fixated on one particular sweetener. Um, stevia just hasn't been used widespread. Um, you know, it, it's really just appeared within the past five to six to seven years or so. And I know that it's been used in, in parts of Latin America, but I really would feel more comfortable if it were not if it were used sparingly and also in combination with other sweeteners. So when I say other sweeteners, it could be things like applesauce, um, apple juice concentrate, using bananas. Um, I don't think agave nectar is is a bad choice because it's low glycemic, especially if it's organic and raw. So uh, brown rice syrup is also one that's moderate in its glycemic impact. So I think um, switching up sweeteners is, is probably a good thing to do, just like switching up oils. Any other questions? How about coffee, healthy or not? OK. All right, a couple of things here. Um, coffee, my goodness, we can probably have a whole um, talk on coffee. But let me just cut to the chase on coffee. And I know that being in the Pacific Northwest, that's a tough one. And people love it for the mental stimulation and the ability to concentrate. But the long and the short of it is that um, coffee has some acute effects on the cardiovascular system. I, I don't think it's healthy for everybody. Not everybody's liver can process the caffeine in a, a good, healthy way. Um, for some people, it, it does cause anxiety. It causes, um, uh, in general, it's a more acidic substance and it can increase cortisol, which is a stress hormone in the body. So um, if I have to say healthy or not, you know, it's so much about the context of how it's being taken in. Is it in the context of a mixed meal? Well, if it's not in an empty stomach like many people when they wake up in the morning to have the coffee with virtually no food, which I don't think is healthy at all, then, you know, I, I might say that within the context of a meal, it might be more acceptable. There are some studies coming out showing that uh, moderate amounts of coffee may be helpful because of the different phytonutrients that the coffee bean contains, things like caseic acid and chlorogenic acid. And, uh, you know, seeing improvements with reducing risk of Parkinson's or type 2 diabetes. But keep in mind that those are epidemiological or population studies and not very, um, they're not always prospective studies. So. You know, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 is very, very healthy, 1 is not healthy. I would say, you know, I'd probably give it about a 4. <laughs> so it's, it's all within the context of how it's used. Okay. Um, okay. So another thing is uh, people are asking, what is the topic for next Sunday? 
The next topic is, uh, we're going to be, oh gosh, this is going to be a great one. You know, we set the stage now as food is medicine, but the next one will be on dietary fats and oils. And so many people have um, so many questions and much confusion around the different dietary fats and oils um, to use. So um, that is going to be covered for next Sunday. Regarding the slides, the slides are not to be given out. Um, they're not available for printing, but you can listen to the recording later via the link that Harmony Hill provides. So um, you will be, uh, and you'll have the handout that I will be providing to Harmony Hill for distribution. So that'll be really helpful. Um, I have another question here. Do you think preservative-free bacon cooked at low heat is any better than regular bacon? Is that a trick? <laughs> well, preservative-free bacon, um, what I would say is I like the idea of low heat. Yes, that's a very good point there, Catherine. Um, I, you're still going to get some advanced glycation end product. It's just a matter of, you know, the, the meat um, coming into contact with the oil and it's still being cooked. But uh, in general, if you can minimize the preservatives, uh, yes, and you're changing up the, the heat, I think that that is also really good as well. So it's, it's all about minimizing. Um, so in the, in the context of what you're asking, I think that those are good, good makeshift solutions for something that you might want to continue eating. And I would also say have some bacon with some leafy greens, if you could, some stir-fried kale to help block um, any of the um, heterocyclic amines or carcinogenic type substances that might be in the meat. All right, I, I think. Uh, <laughs> all right, I, I think we're good on the um, the questions at this point. Um, again, I, I do want to thank you, and I uh, encourage you to be listening in. Again, this is very gracious on the part of Harmony Hill to be offering a series of free webinars to all of you. And it's really my pleasure to, to offer them to you. I, I really am passionate about this work, as you can tell. And I um, am just enthralled to answer your questions and to be here for you. So I look forward to teaching you all about dietary fats and oils for next week. Please bring your, your questions uh, for that session. Thanks so much. Hi, Deanna. I don't know if you can hear me. Deanna, can you hear me? No. Okay. Mm. We're done.